So today's episode is going to be about H2. Oh my god, Windows updated and ruined our mic. Killed the recording. This is going to be take two because of stupid Windows update. Welcome back, friends. Last guy here, and it's time for the vlog. Second take because the first take didn't record. Ugh. So every time Windows updates, for some reason, it disables the microphone. And it updated last night. And I forgot to check. Because, damn it. <laughs> It was an amazing, once again, it was a really, really good vlog. And now i got to try to remember everything I said and see if I can do it more consistent and coherent. And I recorded it five, six hours ago. So great. i got to try to remember what I said. So I try to write down a list of the things I try to remember. So I want to talk to you about the hack that happened at a plant in Florida. Before that, i got to talk about some other things. And that is the podcasts. So Kirby's Toy Box, uh, the newest Kirby's Dreamcast episode is done. It'll come out soon. It'll be on the side channel. I mean, it'll be on the Dreamcast channel. We have too many channels. We have three channels. So on that channel, not the side channel, that channel will be Kirby's Toy Box. It's an exciting episode. I drew a bunch of things for it, so there's things to look at. And you've never heard of Kirby's Toy Box. You've never heard of it. You've also never heard of the Satellaview. So this is a very interesting episode to watch and listen to. So I'm excited for that. That's going to be good. Really excited for the stuff that I did for it and the stuff Jinx did for it. Oh my god, the things that Jinx did for it. We'll explain that later. Um, the other podcast, basically a podcast, I'm going to do solo episodes because, oh my god, I haven't gotten a guest in ever. People just keep turning me down. It's like the pandemic is happening, so they don't really feel like doing anything. Or they're stressed right now, so they're not in the mood to do an interview. Or they're working on a game, or they're bug fixing. There's like a bunch of different reasons. Or they're just busy with work, the people who are having a job. People are just have different reasons why they don't want to come on. And it really sucks. I try to be, you know, very respectful. I'm like, I think it'd be really good for these reasons and everything. And everyone just, you know, they they say they, they say they can, and they give me a reason why. And it's very unfortunate. I really wish I could get guests. I really do. Because it's a fun podcast, it really is. So I'm going to do some solo episodes, I'll come like S1 and so on, so S1, S2, S3, so that they have a different numbering, so they don't uh, fit with the other ones, because I'll be giving my opinions on things. Um, it's going to be like a just cultural thing, just whatever's going on at the time, I'll talk about, and there you go. The first episode is going to be about the whole Gina Karama situation, and the short version is... Oh my god, that whole thing. Um, if it was just the one Instagram message... I think they want they want too far, but it's just actually a whole like she's been doing some stuff the last couple months that's just been getting her in hot water. At this point, they just had to get rid of her. It's really when you're an actor for a thing, you're usually like an ambassador kind of for their brand, and so Disney's not going to really want someone who's coming off as pretty anti-Semitic right now. I don't see it that way, but I still think it was a dumb thing to bring up the Holocaust and try to compare the political climate to the Holocaust. Very dumb, extreme thing to do. As a person, she seems very nice, but she's not, she's anti-trans, she's anti-masker, and for me, this is strike three, just bringing up Holocaust, it's not the best right there, not good at all. Everyone's like, she's blacklisted because she's a conservative. You have any idea how many conservatives there actually are in Hollywood? There's a lot of them. But for her conservative views, what's the conservative view? Uh, talking about the Holocaust? Uh, being transphobic? Uh, uh, what was the third one I said already? Uh, being anti-mask? Honestly, politics should never have touched the virus. It was the most idiotic thing we have done as a country. Oh, one of the most idiotic things we've done as a country was bringing up the virus and politicizing it. That was one of the dumbest things we could have possibly done. It is your responsibility to protect each other with a mask. Not live in fear and try to not live your life. That was the wrong way to frame this thing. It's our civic responsibility to each other to protect each other with our masks. That's what it is. And because we presented it as fear that we shouldn't be afraid of, instead, that was a stupid thing. That was a very stupid thing. The argument is, well, you can't live life in fear. It's not about fear. It's about responsibility. And unfortunately, that's what it is. But um, those are conservative views. Those, those are the conservative views here. When Gina Carano first showed up as Cara Dune... The right was like, look at this SJW bullshit. A woman comes in trying to help everything. This is SJW bullshit. The exact same people who made that argument turned around when Shane Carano got fired and were like, oh my god, look at this bullshit. Look at cancel culture. One and the same. One and the same. What is that bullshit? 
Oh yeah, that's enough about that. I'll talk about that in the podcast. It'll be like every other day or every day, whatever. We'll see how often it is. Like 10 minutes, just talk a little bit, just so I get my mouth going. <laughs> uh, really, it's the hope there is you should always try to do things to grow yourself or for fun. To grow myself with this one, the idea here is just talk about whatever's going on that day or the, or the day before. Uh, whatever's going on in culture, talk about it, putting my opinion on whatever. And by doing that, I'll have a lot of thoughts put out there and thought about. And it'll allow me to make better vlogs. At least I think it'll allow me to make better vlogs. I'm thinking that because if I'm thinking about concepts and talking about them, trying to present them as best I can, it'll make me just a better, just talky person. That's the thought. And we'll see if I'm right or wrong about that as we go. Now, that was a pretty good, that was a pretty good version of the Jenner crowd there. Okay, so, um, want to talk about the Epic Store. Halcyon 6 is the new free game on the Epic Store, and you should get it. Like, I don't like the Epic Store whatsoever. I do not like it at all. It's a terrible store. I wish it was better. I wish it deserved to be competition to Steam, but it's not competition to Steam because it's not a very good store. I, it just has potential to be better. It's just not very good. Steam's just better at it. So they have to compete with giving free games and with these exclusives. And the free game right now is Halcyon 6. We've covered it many times. It's worth getting. It's for free. Hell yeah, get that game. Get it now. It's a very fun game. We've interviewed um, someone from their team uh, multiple times. That was that that soft cookie. Very nice lady. Um, and they also their newest game they made was um, Star Running Games. That's the name of the game. Son of a bee. Okay, so other thing to mention about that is yeah, I hate the exclusivity. I really hate it. I hate it. It's dumb. It's a waste of time. But here it is. And the problem is they get you by the balls with that. So to make you use their store. So, Kingdom Hearts is coming out, so if you wanted to play Kingdom Hearts, finally you can on PC. Exclusive to Epic Store. They got you by the balls there. Right there. Sora's has not dropped, by the way. Um, then there's Metro. They got me by the balls with Metro. I wanted to play uh, Exodus, and I had to be, get it on there. Same thing for Hitman 3. I had wanted it, and I had to play it on freaking Epic Store. That LP is coming up in the future, by the way. Hitman 3 is LP. It's a really fun game. I like it a lot. Kingdom Hearts is insane, by the way. I think I think you're fine if you just never played Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> I I like how I'm anti-advertising. It's okay. It's okay. You don't have to play it. The games are balls insane. And if they were more straightforward, I think they would be better games. They're just balls nuts, and actually, I do think Kingdom Hearts is overrated, to be honest. I really do. I have viewers who love Kingdom Hearts. I think it's overrated. There's a lot of fun nostalgia to it, and I think nostalgia is the strongest part about it. But it's also terrible. Like, I played 1 and 2 and uh, Chain of Memories. I enjoyed them. But they were also terrible. Like, at the same time, they were not the best. Not at all. And now that I've lost everyone, let's talk about water. <laughs> so, let me explain to you what happened here. I wrote, I did a whole write-up on it. So I, I uh, know what I'm talking about without forgetting any details. So, in Florida... Now, I'm going to talk about this to assure you that you are safe when it comes to water, since I'm a water plant operator. In Florida, on the 5th uh, of February, remote access got hacked on this water plant. They came in, did something, messed with some things, but didn't really do anything once. Then they came in a second time. And they went in there and they changed the sodium hydroxide level from 100 ppm to one, to 11,000 ppm. That's parts per million. That is a big change in introduction of chemical. Luckily, the operator that was working there saw this mouse moving around. He wasn't doing it. He's like, what the hell? And he saw them change the chemical levels. After the hacker logged out, they went ahead and put the numbers back down. That was odd. They called their supervisor. And they told him, like, yeah, this freaking happened. And I assume they closed uh, the remote access after that. So why do we know about this? Because on the 8th, there was a press conference with the sheriff, the mayor, and I forget the third guy. I assume he was one of the water plant guys, or might have been the supervisor, or a senior, or just someone with the water. I forget his name right now, though. I forget who he was now. And so, applauding to them... Like, it's on YouTube, the press conference. They explained everything that happened, what they did, why everyone would be safe anyway. And the cool thing was is why they, like, they, well, there's a cool reason they emphasized why they did this, but there's another reason why they did this. So, they emphasized that this was an infrastructure and they got hacked. So, all infrastructure should double-check themselves because, you know, that's not a good thing that they got hacked. Other infrastructure might get hacked as well. They're just reminding that. And here's the thing. 
the other reason why they had the press conference is because the reason why they have to have a press conference. That is, you must tell consumers about situations like this. When the water is threatened for whatever reason or something bad happens to the water, you must tell the consumers. They must be told. There are three stages. There's stage one, two, and three. Stay, and I always forget if one's the worst or three's the worst, but the way the reporting works is you have to report something within a year, you have to report something within a month, and you have to report something within a day, 24 hours. The 24 hours is boil water order. Like, something happened really bad with the water, and you have to boil all your water. You can't consume it, you can't cook it, you can't do whatever. You're boiling it so you can actually use it. Like, you can't just use it out of the tap, you have to boil it. Or there's just, don't touch the water at all orders. There's also that, because the water is something really bad with the water there. That is one of the levels. The second level is what I assume this press conference is about. It is something bad happened, but they dealt with it, and now no one's got to be worried about it. But people should still know what happened. And that's what this press conference is, because that happened three days later, so that's within a month. I assume that's what this is. Then there's the last level, and that is the one-year notice. And that is usually, if you go onto Google, look up your city and put in Consumer Confidence Report. This is a yearly report that is made by every plant about how their water, how their plant did when it comes to water. You'll know if there's been any contaminants, what kind of chemicals were in there, just things like that. Just whatever stuff's going on with your water for that year and the numbers, like how well things were removed, how well things were cleaned, things like that, it'll be in that report. Every year that report must be made by the senior uh, supervisor of the plant. If anything goes down at a plant, it falls on their head. They're the one who's in charge of the plant. The buildup of a plant is you've got your workers, who are operators like me, and then there's maintenance guys as well. They're either separate or the same group. And then you've got their supervisors. And then above those supervisors is the senior. The senior is the one where everything falls on their head. Because the senior's job is to make sure everything's working. They're making sure the guys under them are doing their job. And the guys under them are making sure that everyone else under them is doing their job. That's how this hierarchy works, right? And then the senior goes to meetings and all these things and all the, and doing reports and things like that. The senior position is a position I have to go for at some point in my life. Because since I have a back injury, it's probably better for me at the end of the day to take that position so that I'm not doing as much stuff as I'm doing right now as an operator. Since I had surgery and everything, my back is not the best. And I'll be doing a lot of moving around in my job that could make my back worse. Well, in that, that senior position, it'll be just on my ass all the time doing reports and going to meetings. So that should be safer on my back. That's the reason why I would want to take it. Because I actually enjoy being an operator. Operator's fun. You get a lot of exercise. But too much exercise might be bad for my back. That's just the long and short of it. So that's all that happened was someone came in and put the levels up. And the operator saw it and put them back down. And you report it and there you go. So you might be asking, well, what if the operator missed it? What if he didn't see it? So let me explain some things. One is... Until this conference, I assumed all plants were air-gapped. What is air-gap? Air-gap means you couldn't hack into a plant and move its stuff around. My plant's like this. None of it's hooked up to the internet. It is all closed circuit. It's all there. You cannot get to it. You cannot get to it from the internet. Because you shouldn't be able to get to it from the internet. I was surprised to find out there are plants that actually let people work work on it from outside. I did not see that coming. I did not expect that because that is an important infrastructure. And the other thing is, there must always be a human being on the plant 24-7. There is always someone there. The reason for that is because machines can lie to you. What do I mean by that? They can lie to you because their instruments can fail and they don't know they failed. That's the thing about machines. You can have something just doing a thing and then that thing breaks but whatever receptor just isn't hitting the machine to tell it that it failed, and it'll act like it's still working. It'll tell you it's still working. You have to physically see that it has failed. That is the thing that happens with machines. Machines lie. Humans can lie too, but uh, a machine lying just gets replaced. A human lying goes to jail. So <laughs> humans shouldn't be lying. So... The thing is, the, the sheriff himself put out that it would take 20, 24 to 48 hours before the water would reach the public and bad things would happen. And I'll explain why that is. 
So in a plant, the water comes in, they do a bunch of processes, and then the water goes to a water tank, which is usually going to hold a couple million gallons of water, and the water goes from there to the public. It goes through pipes to the public. Now, why are you safe? The reason why you're safe is, well, one, is the many, well, is because of the many layers that would protect you. Let's say the hacker did this chemical change and the operator wasn't there to see it because sometimes the operator is just doing something else. He's maybe in the bathroom or he's doing his job away from the computer. Because you have a lot of things you have to do. There's a lot of place you're spinning. He might just be not looking there. He might be checking emails for work. He might be doing chemicals. He might be just walking the plant, checking things out. There's a lot of reasons why he might not be at the computer at the time. But here's the thing. He, if he didn't see it, he'd catch it in two to four hours. Why would he catch it in two to four hours? Because you are required to check, to test the water every four hours. Every four hours you're required to test. In the city of San Diego, we do it every two hours. We're checking every two hours so that we can respond that quickly. If something's wrong, we can respond within two hours because we'll have found it. And here's the thing. The water is being tested at multiple stages throughout the plant. Now, sodium hydroxide is used to make the water more alkaline. That's what was being used here. And that water, any chemical is really dangerous at a high amount. Any chemical at all will be dangerous to you at some high number. Air itself is dangerous at a high number. Like, everything is dangerous at a high concentration. So this person put this at a high concentration. It would make people sick. It would not be good for people. And so that's why it's a good thing it got brought back down. But let's say the operator didn't see it. The operator would catch it within two hours or four hours through water testing. They, they would catch it there. Not only would they catch it, the instrument should catch it as well. Throughout the plant, it's being tested for pH. Sodium hydroxide affects the alkalinity of the water. It's not the exact same thing as pH, it's, it's, but pH is part of it. So the water is getting more basic because of the sodium hydroxide being introduced. This would put it up to like 10. It really would put it like 10. So with that much sodium hydroxide in the water, it would put it up to 10, and the instruments would be flashing or blinking or making noises that the pH is way the hell off. So the machines themselves would tell you. But if the machines themselves didn't catch it, let's say they failed, then a human would test and he would see, oh damn, this is really high, what's going on? Checks the chemical levels, oh, okay, they're high, puts them back down. And he'd report that this happened, maybe, I'm not really sure, like there's regulations on what number. I think he'd at least, I would at least tell my super that I don't know how long it's been, but it was like that. And then we would reason that, depending on how long it's been, how much water, most likely it would get diluted in the in the in the tank. I believe our water tank's about 10, 15, 20 million gallons. So this would be only a couple hundred thousand gallons. That would, by dilution, just get evened out in the in the tank. It really would. The biggest tanks I've seen are like 50 million. We're talking about the plant. 50 million versus, like, say, like, uh, like 500,000 of this higher concentration would get evened out a lot. And even if, it, even if it doesn't get evened out a lot, we would lose money, but you could just flush the tank and clean out the tank. You really could just do that. It really depends, because uh, this off the top of my head, I'm not sure how potent it would be diluted to millions of gallons off the top of my head. This is assuming it's not bad. If it's doing the math, the concentration is bad, then yeah, you can just shut off... Uh, the connection to the to the tank, that's always the thing you can do. You can always cut the connection off and just flush out the tank. And then just refill it with good water. You can do that. Anytime you can do that. Because at the end of the day, no matter how much money it costs to shut off the plant or shut off the the tank and cut it off from the public, is compared to the amount of money you would lose if you were hurting people, obviously. Not just the money, but just, you know, loss of humans. Not a good thing at all. So it's always cheaper to just shut things down, make sure everything's working, than to uh, obviously let it ride. And we can do that. We can just like, okay, stop, make sure everything's okay, and then we'll turn back on. It'll cost money, it'll be annoying, but that is what you would do because this is the safety of the public. So what would it take for this water to get to the public? It would take, like the thing says, 24 to 48 hours because it's got to go through the water tank, which has a bunch of water in it already. So as this is going in, as water's coming in, water's coming out as this big mixture of water that's going out. So it's just mixing up and going out and it's getting very diluted as it's going out. You'd have to have a lot of it in there to make it 
con- concentrated enough to be harmful. That's what's going on there. I hope I explained that well enough. I hope I explained that well. So how would it get to... But there's the thing. How much failure would it take for the water to get to the pl- to the tank and out to the public in 2040, 24 to 48 hours? It would require a dozen people and a bunch of instruments to fail. Sodium hydroxide is around the end point of uh, the water process. You're putting it in there to make the water more alkaline, so it, if there's any corrosiveness to the water, it won't be as corrosive. And it helps form a scale on the pipes going through the distribution system, which protects the pipes from any outside problems. That's what it's for. It's a form of protection on the water. It's a form of protection on the pipes. That's what we do with sodium hydroxide. And so, with that happening, the pH would be up, it would be very high, and it would require... So, there would be a pH meter at the, at the site where it's being introduced. There'd be a pH meter before it enters the water tank, and there'd be a pH meter after it, enters the water, after it leaves the water tank. There's also sample points at those places as well. Now, here's the thing. A human being is testing these sample points every two to f- or four hours. Me, I'm testing every two hours. Other places might test every four hours. But a human being is physically testing these things. You're testing for chlorine, for pH, for a whole lot of things you're testing every two hours or every four hours, or once a shift, depending on... Like, fluoride's only once a shift. And there's some things that are tested once a day. And so, that's all happening. In order for the water to get to the public, this bad water to get to the public, this concentrated water, it'd require multiple people to fail. It, since shifts are like every 8, 10, 12 hours, we're talking a couple people on multiple ships not doing it right, or their pH meter has failed. But if their pH meter was failing, they would notice it, because you're, you're going to be testing things that are going to be a little, like, in between 7 and 8. You're testing a lot of things between 7 and 8, and you're not going to get everything at 7 or everything at 8. You're going to know your pH meter is not working out is especially if you're not if you're getting some real if you're not getting this high ass number up here, if you're not getting this ten, then you wouldn't be getting your regular numbers either. So you know your pH meter is not working out, and you'd get a new one and you replace it or whatever. The only way it would fail by the human level is if the human was being negligent of their job. But even if the human was neglecting their job, there's no way the next shift's doing it too. Let's say the two shifts are being negligent, and it required a third shift to be negligent. It would require multiple shifts to be negligent of their job. Not only that, it'd be the pH meters themselves would have to be failing. I'm thinking at least three pH meters would have to fail. At least three pH meters would have to fail, and knowing my system, they cannot be disabled. You cannot disable pH meters from a remote access. You can't do that. That's not a thing that happens. It's not connected to the remote... It's not connected to the computer in that way. The pH meter the human's using is not connected. They only get the signal. That's it. They only get the signal. They can't do anything to the pH meter. So, you'd have to have like four or five multiple pH meters break it, not working. You'd have to have humans who are just ignoring the fact they're not working. And beyond that, in the distribution system, when the water is in the city itself, there are people who are testing the water there as well. There are people who drive around your city every morning, every day. There's someone driving around your city testing multiple water points in the city to make sure the water is okay. And they have pH meters as well. So they would know if the pH was off as well. Water is very important. The only thing more important than water is air itself. So we take water very seriously and we're testing it all day, every day. That's what's happening. And this is the entire country. I could say the same confidence I figure for Canada as well, since they have a similar system to us. The rest of the world has different systems that are mostly similar as well. And so I really do feel water is pretty safe all over the country in developed countries. Not so much in underdeveloped countries, of course, because they have their water sources are different. And of course, there's going to be like towns where they're just not actually paying attention to their, their water systems as well, because the world isn't perfect, unfortunately. But I do know North America is pretty good. Flint, Michigan is thankfully an outlier. This hacking in Florida is thankfully an outlier. These are not common things. The common thing is your water's just safe. Or it might be a little basic for a little bit, or a little acidic for a little bit, but it's never dangerous. 
it's just maybe a little off. I trust the water we have. I drink from the tap. It's perfectly safe water. I can drink it. That's here. I have that confidence in, in the water here because I, I do this water. So I'm assuring you that your water should be pretty safe unless famously it's known that your city's not safe. This is the frustration I have with Flint is Flint never should have happened. Moorhead should have rolled for Flint. What they did at Flint was completely wrong. Bad things should have happened to the politicians at Flint. And it didn't. Only some people got in trouble. A lot more should have gotten in trouble. Is there anything else I'm not... I didn't say... I think that's everything. So basically, a ton of failure would have to happen. A ton of failure would have to happen for you to get hurt by the water. The only other way you get hurt by the water is a freak accident. These do happen. They're called backflow incidents, and they're more on the distribution side of things where they're cross-contamination where something happens at some, some other facility and they accidentally get water into the distribution system. Like, say, like an oil plant or a pesticide plant, something like that, where they're using public water and then they cause a situation like where it gets pushed back into the public water. Or a main breaks and it causes a, a vacuum situation which pulls stuff from like an oil plant or whatever, like an oil place that's using water and sucks it back into the system. Things like that do happen, but that's just like lightning striking. That's just something that just, that's a freak thing that happens. That is something that no one can control uh, until the invention of the, I forget what it's called right now at the top of my head. Um, what it does, it prevents cross-contamination of the water. It prevents backflow. That's what, backflow prevention mm -hmm. So every business, every, everyone has black backflow prevention in California, I believe. I can't remember if it's the whole, if it's the entire country or just California right now. Backflow prevention is a thing that should be the entire country if I'm, because I can't remember the top of my head. And you'll see these things at every business, you'll see these things. Or there are these, there's these apparatuses you see on the sidewalk, like in the dirt, or they're covered by bushes. It's just these metal apparatuses that you see, or there's these giant uh, metal apparatuses with valves and stuff that you see. These things are used so that water doesn't go back into the public water from a business or from some company or whatever. Because a lot of people, of course, use the public water. And yeah, back in the day, bad things would happen because people would just have like a hose in, in something and then f vacuum pressure would come back because something broke. And be in the public water, and people would get in, get hurt. I'm going a little too deep on that. I should probably explain that deeper on another vlog in the future when water comes up again for whatever reason, because that probably just scared some people. It's a freak thing that happens. It's extremely rare. It's like one in a bajillion kind of thing. It does happen, but it's very rare, and it's mostly prevented these days by backflow prevention. There's a lot of means of backflow prevention around the world. I just don't remember what the regulations are. I know every business has to have them. I can't remember every house has one. Um, apartment complexes should have one. There's a lot of backflow prevention, but I can't remember if it's like some legal thing where everyone has to have it or not. Uh, in general, well, companies, businesses do have to have them. It's just residences. I don't remember how that works out. It's a bit of a business. So that's it. That is the vlog. I went on long enough. Hope you had uh, fun watching and listening. I found it very informative and um, makes you more relaxed about if your water system could be hacked. And that's it. I had fun. Hope you've been watching. That's what's all about it. Having fun. Thanks for coming by and see you next time. Mm -hmm.